Hey everyone, welcome back for another deep dive. Today, um, we're tackling a question that hits close to home for, well, pretty much everyone living in the modern world. Can we enjoy capitalism? It's a question, honestly, that I've been wrestling with for a while now. And lucky for us, we have this really thought-provoking essay, Can We Enjoy Capitalism, to dig into. And I gotta say, it goes way beyond the usual economic debates. Oh, absolutely. This isn't just about numbers and statistics. It's about psychology, philosophy even. So before we get lost in the deep end, can you give us the lay of the land? What kind of territory are we covering in this deep dive? Well, the essay itself really delves into Lacan, Heidegger, Marx even pops up. Wow. Okay, so we're talking big thinkers here. It's all about diving deep into the psychology of desire. Mm -hmm. You know, how capitalism shapes what we want, how we talk about it, even how it impacts our unconscious. It's like we're trying to understand the hidden forces that are pulling our strings as consumers. Precisely. Now, the essay itself is structured in a pretty interesting way. It kicks off with this preface by Hervé Castanet. It dives into the heart of the matter with four distinct parts. And then it wraps up with this epilogue that focuses on, get this, Nanyang. Nanyang, yeah. All right, now you have to tell me more about that. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First things first for our listeners, what's the mission of this deep dive? Basically, it all boils down to this complex relationship between enjoyment and capitalism. And I'm not just talking about the fleeting happiness of, like, you know, buying a new pair of shoes. We're talking about the deeper sense of satisfaction, fulfillment even. Okay, so that deep down contentment that seems increasingly elusive these days. Exactly. So the big question this essay grapples with is, can a system that thrives on constant consumption, buying more, wanting more, can it really provide that kind of fulfillment? Now, that's something I think we can all relate to. I mean, how many times have you bought something you thought would make you happy and then well, it didn't quite hit the spot. All the time, right. So the essay really tries to unpack that. Makes sense. Now, let's loop back to this preface by Hervé Castanet. What's his take on all of this? Well, he starts by reminding us just how unpredictable history can be. I mean, think about all the predictions that were flying around about, say, the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. All those experts with their theories. Exactly. And in the end, it all unfolded in a way nobody could have predicted. And I think that's a good reminder that sometimes we can get so caught up in analyzing the present that we completely miss the bigger picture. It's like we think we've got it all figured out, and then, bam, history so, throws us a curveball. Exactly. And that leads to Castanet's main point. Maybe we're all just too close to capitalism to really see it clearly. He even goes so far as to compare our current world to a Mobius strip. Okay, now you're going to have to explain that one. You got it. So a Mobius strip is this fascinating object. It's like a twisted loop where there's only one side. It's continuous. I think I'm starting to see where you're going with this. Kastner's point is that there's this feeling that there's no outside perspective to capitalism. You know, it's like we're all stuck on this one-sided surface and there's no escaping it. So, like, even if we wanted to imagine an alternative, yeah. we couldn't because we're so entrenched in the system. Exactly. And he calls this a world without a real, a world where everything's about justification, control, evaluation. It's like every aspect of life is being measured and analyzed. So we're on this capitalist treadmill, but we're not even sure where it's taking us or if we can ever step off. And in that kind of environment, that's where true enjoyment, what Lacan calls jouissance, that profound sense of satisfaction, it becomes nearly impossible. And isn't that feeling, that lack of true enjoyment, something that honestly many of us are grappling with, especially in this age of like hyper consumerism? Absolutely. And speaking of consumerism, this essay starts with, well, this very striking advertising slogan. It says, I am without limits, positive generation. I swear I see this everywhere. Yeah, it's like plastered everywhere you turn. And it feels so empty. It's the perfect encapsulation of where we're at right now. This obsession with limitless potential, pushing boundaries, you know, always being positive. It's exhausting. It is. It's like this constant pressure to buy more, do more, be more, all in this relentless pursuit of happiness. And that's the million dollar question this essay tackles. Is all of this stuff, all this striving, is it actually making us happy? Or are we just, I don't know, going through the motions, playing a part in a system that's rigged against us? And this idea of nignanya, this empty chatter, it seems like that's part of the problem too, right? Absolutely. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. We'll dive deeper into nignanya a bit later. For now, let's unpack how the essay tackles this question of enjoyment under capitalism. And it all starts with this idea of the order of discourse. Order of discourse. Okay, 
Sounds intriguing, but also a little intimidating. It might sound complex at first, but it's actually quite straightforward. It all comes down to language. Okay, language. Seems simple enough. What's the catch? Well, we often think of language as this neutral tool, right? Like it's just there to help us communicate. Right, like it's just words. Exactly, but the essay argues that language is much more powerful than that. It actually shapes how we understand and experience the world around us. Think of it this way. You don't just look at a map to find your way around. The map itself can influence how you perceive the landscape. I like that. So language is our map, then. Exactly. It's the lens through which we interpret reality. Okay, I'm with you so far. Mm. But how does capitalism fit into all of this? Well, imagine if a select few people got to decide what went on that map, you know? Mm. They decide which routes are highlighted, which places are deemed important. So they control the narrative. Exactly. They control the dominant narrative, the dominant way of seeing and understanding the world. And that's essentially what Foucault, another thinker we'll be unpacking, calls discourse. He argued that discourse isn't neutral, it's all about power. So the people who control the dominant discourse, they have the power to shape how we see the world. Right. And when it comes to capitalism, well, there's a specific capitalist discourse that influences how we think about work, success, and even, yep, you guessed it, enjoyment. And since we're all employees of language, as the essay puts it, we're all subject to the rules and structures of this capitalist discourse. Precisely. And that's why it can be so difficult to even imagine a different way of living, a different way of finding fulfillment. We're constantly being told what to want, how to feel, and what will truly make us happy. And if we're not careful, we just buy into it without even realizing it. We become like these mindless consumers always chasing the next shiny object. Which, ironically, might be the opposite of what true enjoyment is all about. But more on that later. So we're employees of language working under this... Um, capitalist discourse. It's a bit unsettling when you think about it. It really is. But like any good workplace, there's got to be a boss, right? So who's calling the shots in this scenario? Who benefits most from shaping our desires this way? Well, the essay draws this really interesting parallel between the traditional master-slave dynamic and our modern world. Okay, so not like a master with a whip and chains. No, not exactly. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Right, more like targeted ads and those limited time offers that make you feel like you're missing out. Exactly. It's subtler. This form of control operates on the level of our deepest desires and even our anxieties. It's like that little voice whispering in your ear, if you just buy this, then you'll finally be happy. Precisely. And the essay argues that this is actually a brilliant, if kind of sneaky, strategy to mask a fundamental truth about us, about human desire. So what's the truth? Are we all just inherently... I don't know, greedy. It's not so much about greed as it is about lack. Remember earlier we were talking about language and how it creates a sense of absence within us. Right, that void we're always trying to fill. Exactly. So capitalism, with its promise of you know infinite satisfaction through buying stuff, it taps into that pre-existing lack. And of course, it uses it to sell us things. It's like a hamster wheel. You're running and running thinking you're getting somewhere. But you're stuck. Exactly. Stuck in that cycle of wanting more, buying more but never quite feeling satisfied. And that brings us to this really important concept that Marx called surplus value. Okay, economics. I always feel like I need a dictionary when we get into economics. I know, I know. But trust me on this, it's actually really relevant to this whole idea of enjoyment or the lack thereof under capitalism. All right, you've piqued my interest. Break it down for me. What's surplus value and what does it have to do with me and my enjoyment of life? or lack of enjoyment, maybe. Okay, so surplus value is basically the profit a capitalist makes off of a worker's labor. So think about it this way. How much work do you put into your job versus how much you're actually paid? Okay, I'm following. That gap, that difference between the value you create and what you get paid, that's the surplus value. And that goes straight to the capitalist. It's like I'm baking a cake, but I only get a tiny sliver for myself, even though I did all the work. Perfect analogy. And meanwhile, the person who hired me they're out there selling slices, making a profit off my labor, and I guess getting a much bigger piece of cake. Exactly. And here's the thing. The essay argues that this whole pursuit of surplus value, it's not just about, you know, greed. There's more to it. It's also about a certain kind of enjoyment that the capitalist gets from the system itself. It's the enjoyment of control, of seeing those profits grow. So even their enjoyment is kind of... Well, I don't know, empty in a way. You're getting it because yeah. it's rooted in that same logic of lack. It's never enough. Okay, I'm starting to see the bigger picture here. We've got 
language shaping our desires, capitalism whispering in our ear that we need more to be happy. And this whole surplus value thing is like the engine driving the whole system. It's a little depressing, honestly. Yeah, I can feel that way. And it's easy to feel powerless in the face of all this. So are we all doomed? Are we destined to just be cogs in the capitalist machine, forever chasing after things and never finding true enjoyment? Well, the essay doesn't leave us completely without hope. In part three, it shifts gears a bit. Instead of focusing on, you know, us, the subjects, it turns its attention to the objects themselves, all that stuff we're told we need. Okay, so we're moving from the desire itself to the things that are supposed to satisfy that desire. Exactly. And that's where it gets into this idea of consumer fatalism. Consumer fatalism. Okay, I'm intrigued, but also a little afraid to ask. What does that even mean? Well, it's this idea that in a capitalist society, we become, like, dominated by objects. Okay, I can see that. We're surrounded by stuff. It's more than that, though. It's yeah. like their production, their consumption, even how quickly they become obsolete. It's all part of the system that can feel totally beyond our control. And this whole cycle of, like, newer, better, faster, that just plays right into this consumer fatalism, right? Like, yeah. my phone is basically obsolete the minute I buy it because there's already a new model coming out. Exactly. It's like this never-ending treadmill. We're running and running, trying to keep up, but you never really get ahead. And the more we buy into that, the more we feed into that sense of lack we were talking about. We start to believe that, you know, happiness is about having the latest iPhone, the newest clothes, the whatever it is that everyone's talking about. But deep down, I think we know it's never really going to be enough. It's like trying to fill a void with, well, more void. Exactly. And that's where part four of the essay takes us in a bit of a different direction. It introduces this idea of the a priori social, which... Sounds really complicated, but it's actually pretty intuitive. Okay, a priori social, laid on me. So this whole time we've been talking about, you know, the individual's desires, their pursuit of enjoyment within the system. Right, trying to find that elusive satisfaction. Exactly. But what this section reminds us is that we're not just these isolated beings, you know, running around trying to fill some void. We are, by our very nature, social creatures. So our desire to connect with others, to feel like we belong, that's not just some marketing trick. No, not at all. The essay argues that this social dimension is actually fundamental to how we experience enjoyment, how we find meaning in the world. I mean, think about it. Would a delicious meal be as satisfying if you always ate alone? Good point. There's something about sharing a meal with friends, family. It just hits different. Exactly. And this sense of connection, it applies to pretty much everything we do celebrations, hobbies, even just hanging out. It's more enjoyable, more meaningful when we do it with others. And this a priori social, this idea that we're wired for connection, it actually challenges that whole consumer fatalism thing we were talking about. Okay, I'm seeing the tension here. On the one hand, we've got capitalism pushing us towards individualism, you know, buy this, get that, make yourself happy. But then on the other hand, we're wired for connection, for finding fulfillment through relationships. Exactly. And that's where it gets really interesting because even our attempts to connect can be, well, co-opted by the system. Okay, you're losing me a little. Mm -hmm. How can our desire for connection be used against us? Think about social media, right? It's designed to connect us. And on the surface, it does. But it also often pushes us towards comparison, competition, this constant need for validation. Oh, absolutely. It's like, look at my perfect life, my perfect stuff. It's exhausting. And that brings us back to Nignagya, this dominant discourse that's all about superficiality, empty positivity, and meaningless chatter. Okay, Nignagya. It sounds a bit silly, but it's also kind of terrifying when you think about it. It is, because it's everywhere. It's those endless social media feeds, those shallow conversations, those advertising slogans that promise the world but deliver very little. It's like we're all so busy talking that we've forgotten how to actually say anything meaningful. And the essay argues that this nyanya is actually incredibly effective at, like, masking the emptiness of our consumerist culture. It gives yeah. us the illusion of connection, of shared experience, but it keeps us distracted from what truly matters. We're all just cogs in the machine spouting nyanya and buying things we don't need to fill a void that can't be filled. It can feel that way, but there's a glimmer of hope. Okay, please tell me there's a way out of this. Well, the essay ends on this really thought-provoking note. It reminds us that the unconscious is the social. What does that even mean? It means that we have the potential to wake up, 
to become aware of these forces that are shaping our desires. And maybe, just maybe, if enough of us wake up, we can start to challenge this whole system. So what can we actually do? Where do we go from here? Honestly, I think it starts with awareness. Paying attention to the messages we're bombarded with every day, questioning those things that we're told will make us happy. It's about being more mindful consumers, not just of products, but of ideas. Exactly. And it's about making a conscious effort to connect with others in a genuine way, having real conversations, building meaningful relationships, because at the end of the day, that's where true enjoyment lies in our connection to ourselves and to each other. It's about finding meaning beyond the nignanya. Yes. Well, this deep dive has certainly given me a lot to think about. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a sudden urge to log off social media, go for a walk, and maybe have a real face-to-face -face conversation with someone. Sounds like a good plan to me. To our listeners, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into Can We Enjoy Capitalism? Remember, keep questioning, keep connecting, and keep diving deep. We'll see you next time.